So learning objective one um, tells you a little bit about the, uh, the characteristics of a corporation, but it's a very interesting situation first because corporations are, uh, they're created by law, okay? Each and every state in the union has its own set of laws on the books in which uh, a corporation can become a legal entity. And um, when you get the application to file to be a corporation, there's going to be a few questions they have for you. One is what's your purpose? Now, if you're a business, and your main purpose is to make money, you are going to file as a for-profit corporation. Okay. Um, that's what you want to be recognized as under the law, as a for-profit corporation. However, as you see, there's another choice. You can actually uh, choose a not-for-profit corporation. Again, that has to be your purpose. A not-for-profit corporation's purpose is something that's usually social or educational, could be religious, could be charitable. It's, a, it's something other than for profit. The mission of the organization is not profit oriented. So it's a not for profit uh, corporation. But either way, all of these things, you have to make a choice there. Of course, we're gonna be focusing in on the for profit corporation but it does it does ask you what purpose the other thing that uh, and so here you know you probably know of a lot of nonprofit organizations without you know you probably can name a dozen of them off the top of your head including um all the colleges in our area such as uh, vassar and marist and and duchess we're all not for profit uh, I don't know about the CIA. That may that may be a for-profit. I don't know. I have to check. Don't know if that's my head. Um, for-profit organizations, again, you know a lot of them. Um, they don't start this big. <laughs> they don't start this big. They usually start as uh, extremely small companies. So Facebook, again, was just a a few guys, you know, setting up something so they could chat with their friends and and post pictures and other things of their friends. Um, and soon it became a business model. <clears throat> and um, and for a long time, um, when they became a corporation, they kept their shares of ownership. Again, corporations are uh, owned by shareholders. They break up their ownership by a number of shares. Uh, Facebook was privately held for, for many, many years. So was Microsoft. Um, a lot of companies were, were privately held, which means that the shares of ownership were simply held by usually the individuals who started it and their, uh, uh, and their, their family and, and people that are involved in the business, privately held ownership. <clears throat> Um, a change happens, it happened to Facebook, uh, and I'm thinking it may not just be less than 20 years ago, that they decided, well, we are going to make the shares of ownership available to anybody in the public. And so they went through a transition from a privately held corporation to being a publicly held corporation. Now, Facebook stock could be owned by any one of us, okay? All we had to do is call a broker or have an account and buy Facebook stock on the stock exchange. You, can't, you can't do that with a privately held corporation because the shares are not <clears throat> open for public sale. The, shale, the shares are all privately held. <clears throat> and there's still uh, many, many corporations are privately held corp corporations today. Except the ones you see on the stock exchange, the ones that are talked about uh, the most are public companies, public corporations, because their ownership can be held by anybody in the public. 
if they can be owned by anybody in the public, then that means they're subject to um, the rules that were created by the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is a federal government agency that oversees the capital markets, stock market, bond market, uh, things like that. So <clears throat> the SEC requires publicly held corporations to disclose information. Um, and so we know everything that we, we know mostly everything about these publicly held corporations, including how much their CEOs are paid, how much shares of stock, uh, the, the uh, board of directors and CEO and, and other executives own in the company. And that's why we know exactly what the value or the, the, the worth of some famous people are like Warren Buffett, like, uh, well, like Steve Jobs where he passed, uh, like Bill Gates, like um, Zuckerberg, uh, like Bezos of Amazon. We know exactly what, how much wealth they have because it's all public information. We know how many shares of stock they own in their company. It's public information. It's disclosed in the annual reports and other reports. We know what the stock price is. That's also public information. Simply do the math and you know how much they're worth. It's much more difficult with a privately held corporation because the only people who know what's really going on in a privately held corporation are the private owners. They're the only ones who really have the right to look at the financial statements of that company. It's not public information. It's really nobody else's business. So um, publicly held company, privately held companies, uh, you know, Cargill, you might not really know much about Cargill. You probably do know a lot about Bose because it's a, it's a bigger, fam very famous company. <clears throat> but Bose makes, uh, they're well known for their uh, sound equipment and things like that. Uh, if you ever watch a Super Bowl, all the coaches are wearing Bose <laughs> masks and so forth to, to communicate. Uh, Bose has an excellent stereo and other systems. They put in a lot of luxury cars as well. But that's a privately held corporation. What's the sales of Bose? Nobody knows. What's the profitability of Bose? Nobody knows. The only people that know are the owners. And the owners, that's private property. It's private information, okay? Where this got to be a very, and this is normally not a, it's not a controversial thing. Um, what happened uh, over the last four plus years in this country made this issue an important thing because the Trump organization is a corporation that's privately held. It's privately held by uh, Donald Trump and his family members. Um, it's a large corporation. It certainly has assets. We kind of know uh, certain things about it, but we really don't know everything about it because it's a privately held corporation. Uh, and normally, like I said, that's not an issue. That's not an issue. Uh, the issue became he held the, the most public of public offices. Um, with a lot of power in the presidency. And so then the country was debating whether someone who still owned a privately held corporation, because he never sold his ownership in it, he still had ownership. Um, should they disclose that information? Because now they're a very public figure. Again, under normal circumstances, this would not even be an issue. No, absolutely not. Um, but that was one of those interesting debates that I think the country continues to need to figure out just in case we have another person uh, like Trump, who is an owner of a, of a privately held corporation who decides to run for president again um, in the future. I think we really kind of need to figure that out as a country. Um, under normal circumstances, I mean, if it were uh, Zuckerberg, right? We, we, we wouldn't care because we, we would know everything about everything that Facebook is doing and what the interests are. Um, but we, we had no idea with someone with a private business. 
So corporations have, uh, they're popular for a reason. They're, there's three major forms of business organizations, as you know, uh, sole proprietor, partnership, and corporation. There are a lot of hybrids, uh, meaning that these are new forms of, of businesses that are hybrids, they're part partnership, part corporation, like LLCs and PCs and LLPs and so forth. Um, they're all just basically a little bit of this and a little bit of that wrapped up. The benefits of the corporation and the benefits of the partnership wrapped into one. But how do we know what those benefits are? Well, let's take a look. Corporations have a number of different advantages, okay, versus a partnership, a proprietorship or a partnership. Probably one of the biggest advantages is they have a separate legal existence, which means that <clears throat> the uh there's a there's a difference in the law between the corporation and the people who started the corporation so and that's different from being a, a proprietor or a partnership under the law uh mike the business uh, person and mike the person as a sole proprietor or as a partner is the same there's no separate there's no separating the personal and the business. So that means if Mike the person or Mike the business gets sued, all of Mike gets sued, personal and business. All these assets are up for grabs in the worst case scenario. In a corporation, the, the state is granting legal status to the corporation. So the corporation, in essence, becomes a legal being under the law. It's an artificial being, clearly, but uh, it's a legal being under the law. It can own assets, it can have debts, it can sue, it can be sued. Heck, it can even get married. It can, it can merge with another company. Uh, it certainly can buy companies out, et cetera, et cetera. So corporations in and of themselves are their own, uh, I'm not gonna use the word people for, for the sake of, of it, but it's, it's their own entity, it's their own entity. So if you sue the corporation, you're suing the corporation. You're not suing the, head of the corporation. <laughs> you're not suing the employees of the corporate, you're suing the corporation uh, in and of itself. Even though the head of the corporation might be clearly at fault for doing something wrong, still you're suing the corporation. So it's a separate legal existence. And that means that, um, you know, you can, the owners have, uh, can be different than, are seen as, as personally seen as different than shareholders in a corporation. And, and that's a very, very big distinguishing factor, uh, big advantage there. The second thing is um, the liability of stockholders is limited. What does that mean? Well, in a proprietorship, in a sole proprietorship or a partnership, there's a really unlimited liability. If you are at fault, you are getting sued. Thus, the liability can be enormous, right? In the worst case scenario, you know, it's terrible. However, if you are an owner of a corporation, that makes you a stockholder, your liability is limited to whatever money you put in. So you had $10,000 of an investment in that corporation, that's the most you can lose. Okay. Unlike a sole proprietor, if I put $10,000 into my business and my business gets sued for more than that, well, my business is dead now. And plus they're coming after me, my home, my retirement fund, my other assets. So there's no limit to what they can come after as a sole proprietor or a partnership. For a corporation, there's a limit at what you can lose. Ownership rights are transferred uh, on the stock exchange all the time. <clears throat> the only thing that happens on the stock exchange is shares of ownership are being bought and sold. That's it. Um, and I mean, in that, in that sense, it's relatively boring. <laughs> um, I, I think, uh, cause that's the only thing that can happen uh, is selling and buying of ownership, shares of ownership. And that happens pretty seamlessly. 
because the ownership of the corporation is separate from the management of the corporation. So today there might have been eight, nine, 10 billion shares of McDonald's stock traded. Nothing changed at your local McDonald's. Nothing changed at the corporate office because the management of the company is different than the ownership of the, of the stock, okay? Uh, that doesn't happen with a sole proprietorship or a partnership. If I'm a sole proprietor and I sell my ownership to Lindsay, I'm no longer the owner. Everything changes. Now, Lindsay's business, and it's everything is going to be the way Lindsay wants it to be because I'm no longer the owner. Everything changes when ownership changes for a proprietor or a partner. Nothing changes regarding the corporation in terms of how it's managed. Just the ownerships have changed. So the transferability of that ownership, right, is a big plus for the corporate form. Of course, because you can issue any number of shares of stock that you uh, want to pay for, in essence, um, you can raise an enormous amount of money by being a corporation. If I'm a sole proprietor, I'm limited to what I can get for loans and whatever my assets are. If I'm a partnership, it's it's we're limited to what you know all the partners can can grab and bring into the business. There's limits to that. But corporations can have any number of shares of stock um, that it can continue to go sell to investors. As long as investors want to buy it, they can continue to go to the market to sell it. Uh, nothing can be truer than Aurora, Cap Aurora Cannabis, um, uh, a Canadian company that's very popular on, on Robinhood and other apps like that. Um, they continue to ask the market to buy their shares of stock as they're losing money year to year to year. Uh, and investors are pretty hot on pot, so they buy it. Um, that continues that so that's a, an endless stream of income of, of money that can be raised as long as investors think it's a really good idea okay um so that's that's a big big plus another big big plus too is this idea that the corporation is going to live well beyond the the person who started it steve jobs unfortunately has been dead for for a while but Apple lives on, that's a continuous life. Pixar lives on, that's another corporation he started, Pixar, uh, that lives on. You know, Disney has been dead for a while or on ice, whatever you want to believe. Um, you know, maybe he's frozen like the movie. Uh, but nonetheless, Disney is, I don't think, I think if he did, if he ever got defrosted, God forbid, what he would look like, I'm not sure, but um, I don't know what you, how you do that, you put him in the microwave or something, I'm not sure, three minutes, he's thawed, okay, um, I don't know, he wouldn't recognize his own company today compared to when he passed, uh, it is an enormous company, much bigger than he ever thought it would ever be, so, <clears throat> so I doubt, uh, I doubt he would recognize it, but Continuous life is a big thing because if I'm a sole proprietor, if I run like a barbershop and I die, there's no more barbershop. It's dead. It's gone because I'm dead. So the barbershop is dead. Can't go on. That doesn't happen in a corporation. Can continually live on. Okay. Um, again, uh, and I mentioned this already, the, there is a separation between ownership and management. Um, and so owners are not active managers, unlike a sole proprietorship or a partner where you're the owner and you're the boss, <laughs> you're running the show. Uh, that's not the case with stockholders. Um, stockholders just are owners only. Uh, they get to vote on certain things, but that's about it. Otherwise management is separate and they run the company separate on behalf of the owners. One of the negative things that are brought, or what's called a disadvantage is uh, the idea that every time uh, laws are enacted, whether it's from the federal government or from the state government, um, corporations are more than not the, uh, the ones who are going to be taking the, uh, uh, the brunt of the effects of these laws. So uh, whether it's 
discrimination types of laws, minimum wage types of laws, um, uh, various other regulations. Um, you know, corporations are going to be going to be dealing with all of that. I mean, uh, to me, it's not a it's not a huge deal, and I'll tell you why. Um, back in the early '60s, uh, John F. Kennedy. Um, you know, had this idea of consumer rights for, for consumers. It's you know, prior to that, it was basically buyer beware, caveat emptor, you bought something and it broke. Oh, well, company didn't really have to talk with you. Uh, they didn't really have to fix it. Consumer rights uh, laws came into play, consumer protection laws came into play uh, early in the 60s and, they, and they've grown from there. And so corporations had to respond by setting up customer service departments. Prior to that, there was really no customer service. So uh, to me, that's no big deal. Yes, it does place a burden on corporation, but uh, they probably shouldn't be done. They probably should have thought of that in the very beginning. The other thing too is a lot of laws, whether it's civil rights, uh, discrimination, uh, pregnancy, uh, other types of things, disabilities. Um, those uh, basically formed human resources. When my father got out of his first job, he literally just walked up to the foreman <clears throat> at a large corporation called Raytheon, the defense contractor, and said, hey, I, um, I'm, a, I'm an electrician, journeyman electrician, uh, are you hiring? The guy looked at him and said, okay, uh, get here on Monday, Monday morning, seven o'clock. That was it. That was all you needed to get hired. Uh, what if my father was black or some other, uh, maybe an immigrant uh, with, with look different than the foreman? Um, he could have also just said, oh, no, we're not hiring. Um, so yeah, I mean, human resources puts a burden. These discrimination laws put a burden on corporations to keep records, to keep track of these things and to make sure they're doing a better job in their uh, hiring practices. Uh, but so what? To me, I mean, it's not a huge deal. They shouldn't be doing that anyway. Um, and so if the government has to tell them to stop, well, then they have to tell them to stop. Same thing with the environmental laws. I mean, you know, no one should be polluting the earth. We only have one planet to live on. Uh, the fact that they have, you know, safety measures for employees and other types of things, you know, they should be thinking of that anyway. Right. Um, so yes, these are laws that do affect corporations more than any other business. To me, it's not a huge deal because in many cases, it is the right thing to do. It was a reflective of bad management more than it was the government meddling. Um, if management had done the right thing from the beginning, they wouldn't have needed those laws. All right, so the last thing too is uh, taxes. Um, we used to call this a double taxation, and this is the reason why, is because if a corporation has a net income, has a profit, they have to pay uh, income tax on the profit. But then, as you know, some corporations send a portion of their profit to the owners in the form of a dividend. Well, those owners have to put that on their personal um, IRS tax forms, and they have to pay tax on that. So in essence, that's what it's meant by double taxation or additional taxes. That same profit already went through an income tax, and now it's going through a second tax on a dividend. Corporate structures are very, very important. You might think it's the uh, it's great to be on the top of a corporate ladder, corporate structure, and the owners are on the top of this particular um, uh, structure here, but don't be fooled. This is not where the power is, okay? Um, stockholders are not, again, they're not active managers. So who are? Well, they're, the stockholders are represented by a board of directors. The board of directors, um, a, a decent sized group of, of people who set goals for the corporation to enrich the owners. Okay. So whatever policies or goals they said, it's supposed to make the wealth, uh, stockholders wealthier in the long run. Okay. They set the goals and then they go ahead and they hire the top executive. So the president, CEO, all the top executives, 
they hire these folks to get the job done. So they basically hire upper management. Upper management then hires everybody else, you know, the, the other managers, employees, whoever they need to get the stuff done. Um, the problem is, is that many of the people who serve on the boards of directors of corporations are presidents and CEOs of other corporations. And so this particular um, relationship is a little bit, I would say, if there was financial inbreeding, uh, you know, that that would sort of be where it is. You know, it's the, uh, you know, we complain about it and, and Bernie and, and Elizabeth Warren now are saying, you know, well, CEO pay should be taxed based on a certain level. Well, it's these folks, it's the board of directors who are putting together the CEO pay. They put together all the executive pay. And the board of directors are in of themselves really just a group of CEOs. In most cases, that's the majority of them. So clearly they're gonna treat each other well. Uh, and that's what I meant by that sort of a financial inbred. They're all kind of the same and they just sort of take care of each other. It's a power base that is very, um, it's not right. Let's put it, I don't know how, what other words I could use without you know, bringing out the swear words, but it's just not right. You know, it, it's just a very dysfunctional structure because the power is supposed to be with the owners, but in essence, it's not. It's with the board and upper management. They really do sort of have the best world in, they get the best deal out of the entire uh, structure put it that way. Okay, um, again, there are other forms of business that have been talked about, limited partnerships, LLPs, LLCs, the S corporation. Just know that all these other forms are basically uh, combinations of the best of the corporation and the best of a partnership, okay? The best of the partnership is basically it's taxed as an, you're taxed as an individual. Okay, the lowest tax rate possible is the individual tax rate. Corporate tax rates are 21% and up. Individual tax rates are at 10% and up. So whatever profit are made, made by sole proprietors or partners, it gets taxed at 10% and up. So, but corporations have that limited liability thing, right? Um, means that they only lose a certain, whatever they invest, that's the most they can lose. Partnerships, usually it's an unlimited liability. So the best of the corporate form, the limited liability, compare complete with the best of the partnership form, forms these hybrids, basically. The S corporation is basically the same thing. Uh, no taxation, um, uh, no double taxation, but a very small limited number of, of owners. Okay, so, and all of these are made by state governments. State governments are where corporations and these organizations are born. So uh, that's just something to know. So to form a corporation, you have to, uh, you have to file There's an actual application. Um, each state, you can file in any of the states that you want to. Just because we're in New York doesn't mean we have to file as a corporation in New York State. Uh, it might make it easier because we're here. <laughs> but you can file as a corporation in any of the 50 states, any, any of them. Um, there are some states that offer corporations some pretty good deals if they incorporate there. Uh, Delaware has substantial uh, favorable laws to various corporations. Um, and so a lot of businesses will incorporate in Delaware. Uh, New Jersey is listed here as also uh, a state whose laws are also favorable to corporate, the formation of corporations in their, in their state. So again, uh, it's all part of that. So it all starts with an application. The application goes to the secretary of state of the state. So again, state government has the governor, lieutenant governor, there's a treasurer, there's a secretary of state, there's an attorney general, that's the state government. This is the secretary of state at the state level. We're not talking about Washington, DC. <laughs> they don't do that stuff. This is for the state. So every state has one, 
Um, and so the applications are going to be there. Once the state uh, reviews the application, it's all with a fee, of course. Um, then once it gets approved that that application becomes the charter. In other words, that really becomes your the birth certificate of the corporation. You have been approved. Your corporation exists as soon as they approve it. You know, it's like a big stamp on uh, on the paper, and then someone's like, wah, wah, wah. "What is it? It's a corporation, honey. Congratulations." So you know that's basically the birth of a corporation. As soon as the state slaps the stamp on it, you're you're it's true. It happened. Um, and so that's basically that. It's, and I'm sorry for the drama. I'm really I'm sorry for the drama. Actually, no, I'm not. You love it. Um, the state application, by the way, comes with, uh, in New York, uh, it automatically breaks the corporation into 200 shares. That's the minimum amount of shares that in the state of New York, a corporation can have 200. However, you can have as many as you want. You just have to pay the additional fee. Uh, so if you want 200,000 or 200 million, which in some cases big corporations have well over 200 million shares, um, you can continually get more shares as long as you reapply uh, to break your corporation up into a number of shares with the appropriate fee. Uh, but once you are a stockholder, um, there's certain rights you have. The most important right that's talked about is you get to vote for the board of directors on that corporation. And there are certain corporate actions that uh, require stockholders approval before they can get done. So example, um, uh, a merger or a buyout, you need stockholder approval to do that, okay. One other right stockholders have is they have the right to share in any profits of the company. How do they do that? they uh, they will get a dividend okay so they have a right this is not a guarantee it's just a right <laughs> that stockholders have okay another thing they have a right to do is uh, they have something called a preemptive right because like i said if you're a corporation you can go ahead and issue more shares you can go ahead and increase the number of shares and sell more shares Right. So the preemptive right says, look, before the corporation did this, I owned 14% of the company. The corporation has issued more shares. I get the first shot at it as a current stockholder to buy those shares so I can keep my ownership stake at 14% of the company. Otherwise, I let go of that right and other people can buy the stock. So my share value will drop from 14% of the company to less than 14% of the company, depending on how many shares they, so it's called a preemptive right. And the last thing uh, that's a right, which really isn't a right you want to exercise, <laughs> is if everything goes belly up, <laughs> if the corporation goes out of business and is forced to liquidate, if there's anything left over after they pay the lenders, banks get paid first. If there's anything left over, then you get it. You get a residual, call a residual claim. Um, but I will tell you, uh, there's really nothing left for stockholders uh, once things go out of business. The, the, the creditors, the lenders get everything. Okay. This is what a stock uh, certificate looks like. Um, this uh, stock certificate has the name of the corporation listed in, in front. Uh, every, uh, all stock certificates, have, everything is labeled in terms of ownership. Uh, we, we have to register owners so we know who owns what. So, um, so your ownership, your, your name, address, things will be here as the stockholder's name. The number of shares of stock in the company will be listed. Um, and there's some, there's usually a, a, a pre-numbered QCIP sign uh, as well. Some signatures are on, on there. It looks pretty. Um, <laughs> it looks quite pretty. Okay. So um, one thing that you need to know is once the 
state approves that application, the number of shares that are on that application become what's called authorized stock, uh, which simply means that that's what the state has recognized that company having this many shares of authorized stock. So that's all that, that's the most number of shares that the company could sell if they wanted to raise money. If they need more than those shares, they need to go back to the state, reapply for additional shares and pay the fee. Okay. So authorized shares basically is just the number of shares that are on the application when they apply. And they can, excuse me, they can update it by reapplying for additional shares. But authorized stock simply is legally recognized stock, shares of stock a corporation is broken into. What can they do with authorized stock? Well, they can decide to sell some of it. They can sell all of it, but unfortunately that's not a good idea. Uh, usually you wanna sell something. The word issue is to sell. Something that's issued is something that's sold. So the word issue and the word sold is the same. Okay, so issued stock is stock that's been sold. Well, who do you sell it to? You sell it to investors, okay. Um, most stock, uh, particularly because we're talking about public corporations are sold directly to investors and, uh, and thus raising money that way. However, um, sometimes um, stock, shares of stock can be sold indirectly through an investment banking company. So investment banks are the fundraisers of capitalism. A corporation wants to raise money. They go to an investment bank, okay? Investment banks help corporations raise money, either through selling stock or issuing bonds, selling bonds. But that's the role of the investment banker. Um, and so when, the inve when investment bankers help a corporation sell stock, they can buy it themselves and then sell it to investors, usually their customers, or they can allow it to go directly to investors. Okay, so it's really kind of an or, that's why the or is here. Where are you allowed to buy common stock? It has to be through a, a stock exchange. So stock exchanges are, um, there are many of them, uh, certainly the New York Stock Exchange, uh, is the is probably the most well known. The New York Stock Exchange has merged with Euronext, um, and so these are one and the same company now. the um, The New York Stock Exchange is the oldest one we have in this country. It started in the 1700s when traders would um, they met under a buttonwood tree, um, and uh, which eventually was named uh, on Wall Street, okay. And so, you know, that's basically how, uh, how all that sort of started. Uh, in the very beginning, again, it was very informal. It was a group of people that organized themselves. And then as it became sort of a bigger thing then the government said, well, you kind of need to, you know, this needs to be more legit, right? And so uh, they just stepped in with a bunch of different things they have to do. But it is the biggest one that we have. Uh, the NASDAQ exchange is usually, it's an electronic exchange. It doesn't have an actual trading floor like the New York Stock Exchange. You look at pictures, you see a trading floor, people moving about. Um, the NASDAQ stock exchange is, is solely electronic um, and it's basically broker to broker exchanges. So there's a bunch of brokerage houses that basically they have an internet of brokerage and that's really the NASDAQ, that's what it started at. Of course, internationally, you have to notice too that the London Stock Exchange and the Tokyo Stock Exchange are critically important stock exchanges in the world today, but there are stock exchanges everywhere. Okay, just to know. All right, so, um, I'm going to stop there for today. That's basically the, the overview. I'm not going to get too deep into the woods yet. I will be picking up where I left off next time. But uh, that was your bedtime story on corporations and the stock exchange. How did you like it?